anti-Semitism moves from the campuses to Capitol Hill, the U.S. adopts visa restrictions on Israeli Jews with the wrong politics, and finally, the U.S. is pushing Israel to surrender to Hezbollah. I'll have details on all this coming up on In Focus. Hi, welcome to In Focus. I'm going to start with the last headline first because I think that it's much less understood, and so I might as well lead with that. Um, two days ago, Nahar Net, a Lebanese website, had the following story that it uh, ran with. It says here, during his latest visit to Lebanon, U.S. mediator Amos Hochstein tried to raise the issue of land border delineation according to an equation that he said Israel would accept, a media report said. The equation includes, quote, vacating all the contested points in Lebanon's favor, including withdrawal from the northern part of Rajar and key posts in the occupied Shaba farms on the condition that the matter be implemented in two stages, declaring the Lebanese identity of these territories and agreeing that the UN oversee them militarily and security-wise and social-wise until the emergence of another political situation, Al-Akbar newspaper said. It went on. Hochstein was, Hochstein was told by Lebanese officials and indirectly by Hezbollah that this file is not up for discussion at the moment and that all things are frozen until after halting the aggression against Gaza and ending the daily Israeli threats against Lebanon. Okay, so let's just unpack this for a second. Um, do you remember like a year ago, about two weeks before Israel's November, November 1st, 2022 elections, um, the Biden administration, led by Amos Hochstein, rammed an uh, agreement to, um, to delineate Israel's maritime border with Lebanon down the throats of Israel's temporary interim government that was only in charge until the November 1st election. So this was the end of October 2022. There was this deal. And the deal, which no Israeli government in its right mind ever even considered uh, accepting, involved a complete Israeli capitulation to Hezbollah's demands for Israel's territorial waters, our economic waters, and a natural gas deposit that's located partially in our economic waters and, and territorial waters and partially in those that Lebanon uh, is sovereign over, okay? And uh, for years, there had been this whole dispute because Hezbollah had demanded these areas that were clearly part of Israeli's, Israel's economic waters and its territorial waters, including this natural gas deposit that was part in, and part, part in Israel, part in Lebanon. And Israel had refused because it was ridiculous. And we were trying to agree on something. We even said 60-40 of the, of, the, of the land, I mean, of the waters could go to Lebanon, even though they didn't deserve any of it, but we were trying to make a deal. So then the Biden administration comes in just weeks before our election and forces this interim prime minister with absolutely no authority to agree to this capitulation. And it was rammed through because our legal system, we've talked about it so much before October 7th when it all got overtaken by events. Our legal system is incredibly political, very, very radical. And they accepted it because they figured it would help him get elected. It didn't in the event, but we were stuck with this deal, which was a complete capitulation to Hezbollah. Well, there was another aspect to Hezbollah's demand, and that was for the land border. And they're demanding land that stretched from west to east, from Naharia across into the into uh, the Golan Heights and what they call the Sheba Farms and what is called on the maps Mount Dove. Okay. And the United States under the Trump administration recognized Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights in 2019-2020. Okay, so America's position is that this is sovereign Amer Israeli territory, and yet here is the Biden administration demanding that Israel cough up land in the Golan Heights, which is sovereign Israeli territory, to a terrorist organization, Hezbollah, and the, con and the country it controls, Lebanon, as part of a, a land demar demarcation deal. Now, Israel, there's no way that Prime Minister Netanyahu agreed to this. So the idea that Hochstein is saying that this is something that Israel has agreed to, that we're going to give 
all of our land, right, including, you know, all of sovereign Israeli territory, all of the area under discussion is sovereign Israeli territory, that we're going to give it all away to Hezbollah is a lie. But he was here, and before that, he was in Lebanon meeting with uh, Hezbollah officials and straw men who who work at the uh, at the pleasure of Hezbollah um, and pushing this deal forward. Now, there's nothing new about this because this was a deal that he was trying to push forward last summer, and really since um, since he pushed for this uh, maritime deal uh, that revolved that revolved around a complete Israeli capitulation to Hezbollah, and now he's demanding that. Under the under the war, while we're being assaulted by Hezbollah, that we now agree uh, to succumb to further demands far more dangerous. I mean, these were dangerous enough on in the maritime deal. Now he wants us to accept uh, this even more extensive uh, land surrender uh, to Iran's Lebanese proxy Hezbollah, which, as we know and we've discussed here, also poses a strategic threat to Israel's very existence with its 150,000 missiles pointed at all points in Israel, over 20,000 of them just pointing at the border zone that they can use as part of a thrust inside of Israeli territory with their combat forces that are poised on the border, the so-called Radwan Brigades. So they have a plan to invade and capture the Western Galilee, the Upper Galilee, and they have a plan to destroy Israel's military infrastructure with its precision-guided uh, heavy missiles that are capable of uh, destroying uh, many of our military air bases and other strategic sites throughout Israeli territory. So the United States, instead of telling Israel, you know what, you have to take preemptive action so that the 100,000 Israeli civilians who've had to remove from their homes along the border with Lebanon because it's too dangerous for them to be there under these conditions, they're saying, no, 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 you have to surrender to Hezbollah. Hezbollah has to win this war, and it's going to win this war because without really shooting very, I mean, shooting a few shots, but not that many, because what you're going to do, Israel, is you're going to surrender to all of Hezbollah's ungrounded, completely illegal uh, demands for your sovereign territory from Naharia across into the Golan Heights, which again, the United States recognizes Israeli sovereignty over. So this is a complete betrayal of Israel by the United States government under the Biden administration. Amos Hochstein is the one who's ferrying these uh, uh, surrender points to the Israeli government. And I think it's really important for people to understand what's going on. And I also think it's really important for Israel to make very clear that under no circumstances are we going to agree to this. And uh, we expect for the United States to stand with us against Hezbollah and against Iran and its equities in Lebanon just says it's supposed to be doing in Gaza and in Yemen and, and everywhere else. And I would argue that one of the reasons why we're seeing these the Arab states of the Persian Gulf, like Saudi Arabia, the UAE, cozying up to Russia, they just hosted Russian President Vladimir Putin in their capitals today, um, is because they don't trust the United States at all. The Saudis told uh, the Americans, according to a Reuters report today, you know what, don't take any action against Houthi aggression in the Red Sea against U.S. military ships, U.S. naval ships, and other com and commercial vehicles there because, you know, we, we don't want to be pulled into the war. Now, why would they say that? They're under mortal threat from the Houthis in Yemen, which are, of course, another Iranian equity, another Iranian proxy. They say this because they don't trust America at all to stand up and defend them, because why would they? Look at what the Americans are doing, selling Israel down the river, both with Hamas and now what we're seeing with the uh, Lebanese media report. And also we knew it already because Hofstein has been up to this, you know, uh, for the past many months, even before October 7th, uh, they're seeing Isra Israel being sold down the river uh, by the Biden administration in Lebanon as well. So this is something that just has to be reversed. Like it just cannot, it cannot be allowed to continue and I would urge uh, uh, people on Capitol Hill and other places to be aware, to understand how dangerous this is, and to really oppose what the Americans are doing. They're empowering, literally empowering. They are acting as Iran's ally, as Hezbollah's ally with this offer. It is so preposterous. It is so dangerous. And it so discredits the United States as a surplus power. I mean, it, it's like, why do you have these carrier groups 
in, in the Eastern Mediterranean to side with Hezbollah against Israel? Is that what the purpose is? Then make them go away. Okay, at least don't do any harm. What you're doing right now is actually undermining in the most dramatic way the strategic position of Israel, which you acknowledge as America's chief ally in the region. And, and then we'll just go real quick to the visa issue because I think it's also really important. So Tony Blinken and, um, and, the, uh, um, and President Biden and the, and the Secretary of, uh, of the Treasury, Janet Yellen, have all been working really hard on placing sanctions and specifically visa restrictions on entry to the United States to violent settlers, that's Jews, right, in Judea and Samaria, who they accuse of perpetrating violent acts against the Palestinians. And I had a whole um, in focus about this issue and the blood libel at the heart of it, that they're getting this information from Palestinian terrorist groups that are then laundering it through uh, fake human rights groups in the United States and sending it to their cronies in the State Department, who then come out with these lies produce them as American policy papers saying that there's settler violence in Judea and Samaria when the exact opposite is the case. Um, all the same, the United States, uh, very proudly, Secretary of State Blinken was very proud to announce that the United States is now issuing new guidance for visa restrictions on um, Israeli Jews from the, from the West Bank. Um, and, uh, and, and what it says here, and I think it's really important, um, is, is very, very disturbing. So the State Department announcement of this new visa restriction program says this. Today, the State Department is implementing a new visa restriction policy targeting individuals believed to have been involved in undermining peace, security, or stability in the West Bank, including, but not limited to, including through committing acts of violence or taking out other actions that unduly restrict civilians' access to essential services and basic necessities. Immediate family members of such persons also may be subject to these restrictions. So to this, I, I only saw it because I saw a tweet by law professor Eugene Kantorovich from uh, uh, the Kohelet Forum and from George Mason University. He's uh, in charge of the International Law in the Middle East uh, Center at George Mason Law. And this is what he wrote on his Twitter page. He said, the new visa policy, when read carefully, is neither limited to settlers or violence. It sanctions anyone, quote, believed to have been involved in undermining peace or stability, unquote, in the West Bank. In short, it is a carte blanche for the State Department to blacklist people whose politics it dislikes. And don't expect PA officials responsible for pay, for sl pay to slay, uh, to wind up on the wrong side of this. And Professor Kantorovich, my friend Eugene, um, is absolutely right about this. The purpose of this guidance is not to punish non-existent violent settler violence, okay? Because there is none. It's, it's, just, it's just a slander, all right? There's, there are many um, sites between Jews and Arabs in Judea and Samaria over land, but in the overwhelming majority of cases, these are provoked by Palestinians and often what they call settler violence. In fact, in every case that I've seen over the past several years, the Jews that are involved in these violent uh, uh, exchanges with Palestinians are defending themselves from lynch mobs, okay? So they come at uh, Jewish shepherds with axes and um, and with and with guns, and the Jews shoot in the air, or they shoot at the people who are attacking them, and then immediately this is portrayed in the media as Jews murdering Palestinians, and they never explain that there was a lynch mob here that was killing, trying to kill, attacking, wounding Jews who happened to be out in orchards and fields on the ground, in, you know, on the roads in Judea and Samaria, and they were put upon by these mobs. So no, that never is said. What's always reported is that a Jew killed a Palestinian who was usually a minor and always innocent and just minding his own business, and, and nobody understands what the ax was doing in his hand when he died. At any rate, we're seeing um, a, a deliberate um, slander of Jews who reside in Judea and Samaria, and the guidance that the State Department put out makes clear that this is not just a, against people who actually engage and are found guilty of engaging 
in acts of wanton violence, but rather it's against anybody who opposes the Biden administration's two-state policy, right? And one of the interesting things really is, you know, how this is all uh, being played out in President Biden's reelection campaign, because Biden, on the one hand, is, you know, he's talking about how much he supports Israel. And on the other hand, whether it's in Lebanon or whether it's uh, his policy towards the Palestinians in general and, and the way that they're actually going after, literally going after uh, Israeli Jews who oppose their positions on on giving land and sovereignty and an army, uh, U.S. trained army. Uh, to the Palestinians who are dedicated to the proposition that all Jews should be dead. Um, so uh, I got a transcript of one of uh, President Biden's speeches on the campaign trail, and he was not he was talking to donors. And um, from what I saw, you know, he, he it was really interesting because he did his sort of stump speech about how, you know, he's been pro-Israel since he was a young senator and he met with Golda Meir and she said, we have a secret weapon, which is that we have nowhere to go. And so he repeated that again. And then he said, you know, what we're trying to do now in the end game is we want a Palestinian state. We want to bring it to a two-state solution. And he acknowledged that the government of Israel does not support this. And really nobody in Israel supports this, but that they're going to go ahead and they're pushing ahead really, really, really hard with a two-state solution. And, you know, the thing of it is that We've heard people, American Jews in particular, saying for years that they can, I, mean, I remember appearing with Alan Dershowitz time after time after time at these Jerusalem Post conferences where he was saying that he's pro-Israel and pro-Palestinians. But the thing is, is that if nothing else has been made clear over the past, you know, on October 7th, say, and since, you can't, okay? <laughs> You're talking about people, and you see it on Harvard campus today, which we're going to get to in a second. You see it on all of these elite university campuses and not so elite university campuses. And none of them, by the way, are elite anymore because who really would hire anybody with a degree from there? Anyway, they here you, they all are saying what we want is from the river to the sea. What we want is to globalize the Intifada. What they're saying is that, and nobody is decrying genocide. Nobody is decrying the acts of genocide that Hamas perpetrated on October 7th, or the fact that 80, or 86% of Palestinians in Judea and Samaria supported, another 60 odd percent in Gaza supported, and that 75% of Palestinians overall support the acts of genocide of October 7th and support Hamas. Nobody's, nobody's condemning any of that on college campuses today. And nobody who is pro-Palestinian and from Peter Beinart to Rashida Tlaib in the United States is decrying the uni unity of purpose of the Palestinian people such as they are uh, towards the accomplishment of their goal of the annihilation of Jews and the globalization of their intifada in order to destroy the Jewish state. Nobody in, in, in any of these places in the United States is taking any issue with this goal at all, okay? And so the idea that you can be both pro-Palestinian, pro-Israel at this point is laughable. Like, you just have to get over it. It's not possible anymore. You can't. And so here's President Biden speaking, I, mean, I was explained, it was explained to me that he was actually speaking to Jewish donors and saying, nobody in Israel supports my goal, but I don't care. I'm moving forward to it with it. And by the way, there was a Politico article yesterday that said that as well, that they're not even going to take Prime Minister Netanyahu's positions into account. It's not just Prime Minister Netanyahu. You know, the Israeli people oppose this. <laughs> the data are showing that the Israeli people have completely moved on. We get it, Right. But the administration does not, and they don't care that we get it. They don't want to acknowledge it themselves, and they won't. So he's pushing this forward, and he's saying, we want a two-state solution, which brings us again to the whole anti-Semitism thing on U.S. campuses. So everybody's been talking about, I've been talking about on Twitter, and, every, and everybody's been talking about the hearing on Capitol Hill on Tuesday where you had the presidents of Harvard, MIT, University of Pennsylvania, all being called to account for the fact that their universities have become um, contemporary uh, enactments of the University of Heidelberg or the University of Leipzig from Germany circa 1933, right? I mean, they have become Nazi universities where Jews, Jewish students, Jewish faculty are living in terror, are afraid to teach, are afraid to study, are incapable of studying because they can't 
be at the library in peace. They can't be in their study groups in peace. They can't be in class in peace. They can't walk through campus in peace because everywhere they go, they're attacked, they're harassed, they're, they're assaulted, and they're insulted and humiliated everywhere that they go, and they're demonized everywhere that they go. There's like literally no safe spaces for Jewish students any longer on these campuses and tens of others like them across the United States from coast to coast. So because there have been so many complaints against these specific um, campuses. You had Congress subpoena, I think subpoena, anyway, call in for testimony the presidents of these three universities. And Representative Elise Stefanik of New York was fabulous, and she asked them a question. She said, "Is our calls for genocide against the Jewish people uh, against the code of conduct on your campuses?" In other words, you know, it, can you, well, not in other words, can you call for the genocide of the Jews safely, get away with it without any, without any consequences at Harvard, at University of Pennsylvania, at MIT? And the answer of all three of these university professors, you know, who like they give guidance at MIT, right, to professors that, you know, it would be a microaggression on their part if they have gender dysphoric students who want to adopt a name of, you know, that's not their given name because they've decided that they're a boy or they've decided that they're a girl, even though they actually are not. So they have to call them by their gender dysphoric new names. They're not allowed to call them by the name that's on the roster, you know, the name of the kid that the parents are paying them tuition to educate. No, they have to embrace the gender dysphoria of the student in question and call them by whatever name they've decided that they want to be that particular day. So, and if they don't do that, then they're guilty of a microaggression. But if you're a professor at Harvard and you call for globalization of the Intifada and Palestine from the river to the sea, and, and literally are calling through those statements and others for the genocide of Jews, that's fine. Like that, you know, and they even all said, that it's only bad, it's only against their code of conduct if he actually carries out acts of genocide by assaulting Jews, by raping Jews, by whatever, you know, like that would be bad. That would be against their code of conduct. But calling for uh, endorsing the genocide of Jewry, that's not bullying, that's not harassment, and that is not against the code of conduct on their campuses. Ms. McGill, at Penn, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Penn's rules or code of conduct? Yes or no? If the speech turns into conduct, it can be harassment, yes. I am asking, specifically calling for the genocide of Jews, does that constitute bullying or harassment? If it is directed and severe or pervasive, it is harassment. So the answer is yes. It is a context-dependent decision, Congresswoman. It's a context-dependent decision. That's your testimony today. Calling for the genocide of Jews is depending upon the context. That is not bullying or harassment. This is the easiest question to answer yes, Ms. McGill. Okay. So it was fantastic that Congress had this absolutely great, wonderful, terrific, good for carting them in, good for showing exactly what we're dealing with. And Jews really have to leave. I, I think that they just have to leave, you know, no more money to these places, not just donors, parents too. You're paying them like a hundred grand a year so that they can, they can abuse your children. I mean, forget the indoctrination and all that. Your children are being abused and you're paying for it. That is insane. You know, that's worse than income taxes, right? You're actually directly paying people to abuse your child. That's crazy. That's got to stop. You know, community college is like so much better online. And I say this as a graduate of Columbia and Harvard. I would never send my kids to any of these schools ever. You can send them to Israel. We have woke administrators here. But let me tell you, the students don't really take it. And they would feel better, at least socially, and they would be protected. And hopefully, at some point, we're going to have to take care of the administrators as well. And they may be waking up. I mean, the University of Pennsylvania, uh, of Tel Aviv president, and this is a woke university in Israel, and he called uh, uh, the terrorists in Hamas Amalek. I mean, that like was something nobody ever thought would happen. But there you go. It only took a, act, a single day of genocidal acts against the Jewish people to wake him up. But, you know, so I would send my kids here. You know, if you think, oh, well, the engineering department at... I don't know, MIT is better than it is at Tel Aviv. No, it's not, okay? It's not. Just bring them here, 
move them here, you know, send them here to get an education. And maybe it's not as prestigious, although I don't know what that means anymore. I'd be much more likely to hire a graduate from Tel Aviv University if I had an engineering firm than from MIT, where you don't even know what 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 grades mean anymore, right? So, I mean, I think I think you should reconsider the whole concept of this abusive relationship with them. But you know, one of the things that I find really disturbing is the question of like. Where is the Jewish leadership in this? So we know that Jewish donors are walking away from a lot of these universities and they're suffering. I saw a New York Post article saying that they're lowering the amount of money that you have to give to get your name on something in these universities from 20 million to 2 million because they're trying, now that they don't have the 20 million Jewish donors any longer, they're going to you know lower level you know, multimillionaires who can cut them $2 million checks and get the same. Like, so they just charge Jews 10 times more, but we won't go into that. So they're like, they're, they're now going to lower level donors to try to get them to give money to make up the flack for the fact that they're anti-Semites and the Jews are walking. So that's great. But there's this one glaring thing. Lori Regan wrote about it uh, in her, in a very important column that she wrote at JNS a couple of weeks ago after the, uh, the, uh, anti, anti-Semitism, uh, demonstration on the mall in Washington took place. And she noted there that, you know, there was no actual demand for anything on the part of the 300,000 Jews that came to Washington that might have been worthwhile, like passing the military aid you know, uh, to Israel. I mean, S Senator Schumer went there and said, I'm Shomer Israel. I, you know, you can depend on me. And he went straight back to the Senate and he uh, voted against aid to Israel because he wanted it to be with Ukraine too. And he still is blocking it. It's still stuck in the Senate. He hasn't passed it. So like they didn't ask for anything concrete, the th you know, because the leadership didn't ask for anything concrete. They didn't ask for UNRWA to be defunded, even though three weeks ago, it was already clear that UNRWA is just a Hamas booster organization. It is a terrorist organization um, and, and it has to be defunded. Americans are paying, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to this terrorist organization every year. And it's just increased, I think, like last last year. So they didn't ask for any of that stuff. And all of that stuff were deliverables that they could have asked for. And of course, they didn't call for any serious action by the administration for the civil rights division of the Justice Department that's led by this lady named, I think, Kim Clark, who has a record of anti-Semitism in her past while she was at Harvard Law School, right? And she's in charge of the Civil Rights Division. So lo and behold, now as the head of this incredibly powerful division at the Justice Department, she's not actually doing anything against these calls for genocide that are taking place not only on college campuses throughout the United States, but on the streets of all the major cities of the United States, okay? Like this is something that the Justice Department could actually do a lot to solve, and we don't see any serious action being taken by the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department, which is a specific entity inside of the U.S. government that's supposed to be leading the way. But that's not, you know, they didn't ask for that either. Why? Well, I think it has something to do with the leaders of these major Jewish organizations. I'm just going to give you the one example that Lori Regan wrote in her article, which I was just like my blind, like my mind exploded when I read it. So do you there, the vice chairman, a, a lot of the Jews left the University of Pennsylvania's Board of Trustees because under, you know, the current president, Liz McGill, one of the three who, like, refused to say that inciting genocide and calling for genocide of Jewish people is contrary to her university's code of conduct. Like, no, only if they actually carry out genocide. That's what she said. It, it really depends on, the, like, only if it turns into action. So only when you murder Jews will you be opposed to. Anyway, so Liz McGill is one of these. And a lot of, you know, I think two or three multi-bazillionaire Jewish donors left the board of trustees because of the incredible anti-Semitism that's going on on campus. But one person who did not resign is the vice chairman of the University of Pennsylvania's board of trustees, and it's a woman named Julie Platt. What is she also, what other board of trustees is she on? Well, she's the deputy chairman of the board of trustees at University of Pennsylvania. Guess where she's the chairman of the board of trustees? Uh, the Jewish Federations of North America. Who'd have thunk it, right? So Julie Platt is the head of the Jewish Federations of North America, and she did not quit 
University of Pennsylvania's Board of Trustees, despite the massive amounts of anti-Semitism. So you look at these kinds of things and you sit, you know, I think it's fantastic that Congress is actually, you know, doing something and Speaker Johnson has to be applauded and uh, obviously Elise Stefanik and, and, and so many others. And I didn't see the whole uh, hearing, but I'm sure I'm going to, I'm going to take the, the time to do so because I think it's important. I think we should all do so. But, you know, they were great. They were fabulous. And there were questions and they exposed the raw anti-Semitism, the raw Jew hatred, the reason why it's allowed to just go nuts on these college campuses because the administrators themselves harbor these views or are just chill with the idea of the annihilation of the Jewish people in the United States and Israel, wherever. You know, like, that's not their thing. Like, but, you know, you mess, you mess with people with gender dysphoria, you know, who want to change their sex, who want to do whatever. Like... No, 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 no. You don't have a free speech right to do that, right? You got to call them by whatever name they choose on any given day, because otherwise that's a microaggression. But calling for the annihilation of the Jewish people, that's chill. Anyway, so, you know, we like there are so many things that have to be done to protect the Jews of the diaspora. There's so many things that have to be done, obviously, uh, first and foremost, militarily to defend the Jews of the state of Israel. But one of the things that the Jews everywhere have to do is start telling the truth is to stop beating around the bush is to recognize the truth that's just screaming at us and smacking us in the face and slaughtering us and raping us and murdering us and all the rest of it we just have to stop okay this this just can't go on you know to be pro-palestinian fine maybe not always but today it's very clear that you are standing with people who as a people as a collective and as individuals support the annihilation of the jewish people okay that's what it is so people who are pro-palestinians are by their own definition not pro-jewish not pro-israel not pro-jewish anywhere they're anti-jewish all right and, and we just have to accept that very sad very hard you know we wanted peace we tried so hard but die, enough, you know, it's over. You know, you want to say suspended, say suspended. We can always have our hope. But not until Israel wins, okay? Not until we've actually annihilated Hamas. I have a whole, conver I have a whole conversation, a really important conversation that I just taped now with Dr. Moti Kedar, one of the world's experts on Islam. And we talked about really what what we saw on October 7th and since, and what Hamas, what makes Hamas tick? What is the doctrine? What is the belief system? What is a value system that makes a society support burning babies alive and, and the brutal, uh, savage gang rape of women? What, what is it? And so we talked about that at length, and I think you should watch it because it's sort of a companion piece to this. If you want to protect yourself as Jews, where you live, whether it's in Israel or in America or in France or anywhere else, you can't make light of situations. You can't have euphemisms for genocidal hatred of, of the Jews. You can't. And you can't pretend that people who use euphemisms, who explain it away, who justify it, are reasonable interlocutors for anything. They're not. And you have to be able to make concrete demands to policymakers whether in the U.S. government or the Israeli government or the French government or any other, to stand up and defend the rights of Jews to live in freedom and security. And anybody who doesn't is not our friend. So, you know, those are my thoughts, whether it's in Lebanon, we cannot surrender to Hezbollah. We can't. And anybody who encourages us to do so is acting not as an ally, but as an adversary. We cannot. I mean, we cannot accept the idea that slanders against Jews who oppose America's insane policy of establishing a Palestinian state now is an enemy of the United States. It isn't the idea of establishing a jihadist state organized around the, the one concept of annihilating the Jewish people, that opposing that is something that should bar people from getting into the United States. That's, in, that, that's crazy. And it can't be allowed to stand. This new visa restrictions policy is openly anti-democratic and anti-Jewish, and it shouldn't be allowed to stand. It's not against settler violence. It's against people who oppose this delusional, this anti-Jewish two-state solution. And finally, 
if we want to protect Jews on campuses, and again, I don't, I, I was just saying, like, we got plenty of universities here in Israel where your children can get educated for far less than $100,000 a year, right? So think about that, but you shouldn't be paying 100, you have to end this abusive relationship. And the Jewish leadership in the United States has to actually start standing up for the Jews and has to decide if it wants to stay with its progressive friends who are anti-Semites, or if it wants to stand for this community that it claims to lead, because it can't do both anymore. We saw that very clearly on Capitol Hill on Tuesday, and that just has to be the idea going forward. Yeah, we're at war, and you're either on our side or you're on the other side. Pick. Those are my thoughts for now, and I'll talk to you again next week. Shabbat Shalom, and Hanukkah Sameach. Have a great Hanukkah, and maybe we'll talk a little bit more about it um, and what the meaning is of shining light in dark places going forward next week. But in the meantime, just remember, it's, we're, we're, on, we're on the good side. We're on the side of light, and we have to spread that light. And you spread that light sometimes by standing up to people that you thought are your friends. Anybody who stands with darkness, they're not on our side. All right. Hug some Take care.